Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 14th of April and this quick look at the week ahead with me Michael Hewson. It's been another positive week for equity markets, um, lower than expected inflation numbers out of the US has prompted some optimism that um, we will see rate cuts by the Federal Reserve or from the Federal Reserve by the end of this year. Me myself, I think that's highly optimistic. And certainly I think if you look at the way US bond markets and the two year yield, which is a fairly decent proxy for um, whether or not we're going to get rate cuts by the end of this year, yields on the two year haven't really moved that much over the course of the last week or so. Uh, and I think that's very, I think that's, I think that's extremely significant. Um, even though we've seen headline CPI in the US come down in March from six to five, six from six percent to five percent, um, core prices actually edged up to five point six percent from five point five. So there's still an element of stickiness in core inflation, particularly around on the CPI measure. On the other hand, though, the day after we got PPI, and PPI we saw a big fall. In March, final demand headline fell from 4.4% to 2.7% in March, and core prices also slipped back by more than expected. So there's certainly elements um, when it comes to factory gate prices that would suggest that inflationary pressure is subsiding, but that's, that's really borne out in the manufacturing ISM numbers, um, where prices paid is in contraction territory in the services sector we are still very much in expansionary territory we're in the mid 60s there so while manufacturing inflation ppi may be subsiding service sector inflation food inflation still remains very much towards the upside and 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 the payrolls numbers that we saw um, last friday also would appear to suggest that the employment the labour market still remains fairly resilient. So there's that. And I think when you've got a labour market where the unemployment rate has fallen and a participation rate is starting to rise um, back to the levels, but not quite back to the levels we were pre-pandemic, but it's certainly heading back in that direction. And you've still got just under 10 million vacancies. The Fed's going to find it very, very difficult to justify a rate cut when the unemployment rate is still well below the end of year target rate that the Fed has of four and a half percent. The unemployment rate in the US is around about 3.4, 3.5%. So there's still quite some way to go on the unemployment front. Um, and while employment is low, when un while unemployment is low, that suggests that personal spending, personal consumption is likely to remain fairly resilient and that will probably keep um, inflation underpinned. Um, if we look at where inflation was in the summer, last summer, 9.1%, um, we're now into March, nine months later, then it's only back to 5%. So it's still got quite some way to go. So I think the discussion of rate cuts is slightly premature. Um, certainly, that's certainly true in Europe, and it's certainly true in the UK. Let's look at some of the key movers this, this week. Um, we've seen the FTSE 100 heading back higher again, fairly see, been seeing some fairly decent gains this week, back above the 50 day moving average. We're not quite back to the levels that we were on the 8th of March when we closed at 7,900, um, but we're not far off. The main lags there are, are in banks, um, commercial real estate uh, and in um, oil and gas. Um, they haven't fully rebounded from the losses that we saw in March. So still got some time to go there. Been slightly more positive for the likes of the DAX, where we've seen a move um, back above the previous highs um, in March. Now we're looking to potentially retest that 16,000 level that we last saw back in January 2022. So the 2022 highs are still very much a focus. Um, around about 6,285. And the CAC Courant has actually made new record highs 
this week on the back of a luxury lift. Um, LVMH and Hermes posted very strong um, Asia sales numbers in Japan and in China, which neatly segues me on to next week's China first quarter GDP numbers, China retail sales numbers. Given the fact that we've seen such strong numbers from those luxury providers, then March retail sales in China should round off a fairly positive quarter for China GDP. Expecting a expansion of 2.1% um, as a result of um, Chinese New Year. Chinese New Year should have seen a big rebound in demand. That was certainly borne out by um, the Chinese trade numbers that we saw earlier this week, which saw exports jump quite sharply into positive territory, but also imports rebounded more than expected. So that would suggest that we're getting a little bit of a China reopening lift. Of course, whether or not that's sustained into Q2 is anybody's guess, but certainly the guidance offered by LVMH and by Hermes would suggest that they are optimistic that that will continue. Um, so that's um, that's the European markets. The NASDAQ um, is rebounding somewhat on the back of optimism that um, the Fed is close to the end of its rate hiking cycle. I certainly think that's true. Um, there's certainly potential for another 25, 25 basis points in March, uh, in March, in May. Um, but and of course, it's really a question of what comes after that. At the moment, the market is pricing in the prospect of rate cuts by the end of Q2, potentially beginning of Q3. I struggle with that, if I'm honest. I really do. Um, as I pointed out earlier, while, while, while unemployment, while the unemployment rate is still down around about three and a half, between three and a half, four percent, why would the Fed, why would the Fed look at cut, cutting rates? Um, that would suggest that the labour market is still fairly tight. Yeah, weekly jobless claims have jumped. They're now around about 235, but they're still at the very low end of where they've been. And, and continuing claims actually fell back last week for, to just over 1.8 million. So I don't think there's any hurry, any rush for the Fed to start considering cutting rates. At the moment, the market seems to think we will see that. I struggle with that. We are still below the peaks that we saw in early Feb on the S&P 500. Currently capped between capped at around 4,200. Fairly well supported at 3,800. I think that's the range of it for the time being. And obviously, we've got the start of bank earnings season later today, which could um, be a catalyst for a move lower. Nasdaq again. Um, we are seeing a fairly decent rebound on the back of some really big declines, mind you, from the highs that we saw in late 2021. Um, one of the things that has also driven the rebound in the NASDAQ and the S&P has been a cohort of about five or 10 tech stocks, um, four or five of which include Meta Platforms, um, Tesla, NVIDIA, and, um, and, a, and a couple of other um, big hitters like Microsoft. So it's very much, the rebound has been driven very much by a cohort of around about five or 10 big caps, big cap tech stocks, while the rest of the market has been left behind to a certain extent. So be paying particular attention to whether or not the durability of this NASDAQ bounce above support at 12,850 which was the previous highs, is sustainable and we can kick on to the highs that we saw back in August 2022, around about 13,600. So 12,850 on the downside is a fairly decent support, 13,600 on the top side is a potential target if we're able to sustain a move higher. We've also seen a much weaker dollar over the course of the past few weeks and that's, that's no better manifested in the way that your dollar has broken towards the upside. The next so the next level here is 111, um, 111.05, 111.10, or these 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 two peaks back in March 2022. So we're approaching one-year highs around about 111.85. Can we close in on that? To be quite honest, there's no reason why we shouldn't. If you work on the premise 
that the ECB is likely to hike by another 50 basis points in May, and the Fed is probably going to be another one and then done. Um, the bigger question is, is whether or not the ECB can follow through with any more than another 50 basis points. And at the moment, the mood music out of um, Frankfurt and Northern Europe is that 50 basis points is the minimum um, that we can expect in May, and we could well see another 25 or 50 thereafter. It remains to be seen whether or not, of course, that is sustainable. But for the time being, that should support euro dollar to um, the um, disadvantage of the US dollar. Similarly, with cable, um, we I think can still expect another 25 basis points from the Bank of England in May. The bigger question will be whether or not we see anything after that. Are we near a peak? Are we near terminal rate of 4.5%? Um, certainly that would probably be my terminal rate, but that was predicated on inflation being back below 10%. And that, and we aren't there yet. We bumped up to 10.4% in February. The big question as we look ahead to this week's or this coming week's March CPI numbers from the UK, the unemployment and wages data from the UK, and also the retail sales numbers from the UK, is whether or not um, we start to see a material slowing of inflationary pressure. Um, the most recent GDP numbers for February showed the economy stagnated in February. Much of that was down to industrial action, pay disputes and what have you. That would suggest to me that inflation is likely to remain sticky for a while, notwithstanding the price increases that we're starting to see and will come through in April when it comes to council tax. Um, and depending on where you live, that's anything between 5 and 15 percent. We've got retail, so we've got RPI price increases from the likes of Sky O2, Virgin Media, BT and what have you, which is likely to impact in consumer spending patterns. And obviously, we've also got the fact that the energy support um, uh, top up from the government um, is no, no longer is no longer available. Um, that was available in and has been and was available over the course of the last 12 months. That rolls off 67 pound a month top up for your energy bills. So that's not happening now. So that's likely to be a further headwind for consumer spending um, as we look ahead to obviously March retail sales. For the UK, we saw fairly decent numbers in January, February, 0.9% in January, 1.2% in February. Stands to reason that March will probably see a little bit of a setback, but nonetheless, we should still see GDP growth for Q1 in the UK economy. Um, so that could well help support the pound um, going forward, particularly given the fact that if the Bank of England does finish at 4.5%, with inflation uh, in and around 10% and core prices around about 6%, they're not going to be cutting anytime soon. Whereas the Fed is pricing, the markets are pricing Fed cuts, they're certainly not pricing Bank of England, well, not yet anyway. Um, so those, those are the key, those are the key um, uh, economic numbers for next week. To sum up, we've got CPI from, CPI from the UK, wages, unemployment, and retail sales, and we've got China retail sales and China first quarter GDP. On the earnings front, we've got EasyJet, Tesla, and Netflix as notable standouts. Obviously, we've got Goldman Sachs, which will build on, and Morgan Stanley, which builds on today's JP Morgan, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo numbers, which could give us an insight and will give us an insight into the fallout of the Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank um, uh, fallout that we saw in March. What does that tell us about um, loan demand, not only from consumers, but also from businesses per se, um, consumer confidence, um, mortgage demand, obviously, as well, and whether or not these big banks saw a significant amount of deposit inflow as a result of the problems that we saw as a, in, in US regional banks. So let's start on the earnings front. And let's start with one of our client favorites, Tesla. Seen a fairly decent rebound from the lows that we saw um, back in January, lowest level since August 2020. 
combination of concerns over rising costs, increased competition, and the focus of Elon Musk, given his problems with Twitter, um, saw the shares plunge from peaks of $400 at the start of 2022 um, to lows of $102 at the start of 2023. So that's a big that's a big drop. Now, obviously, the share price has doubled since then. And the 200 day moving average is acting as a barrier to further gains for the time being. The company is still selling record numbers of new cars. Um, it delivered 422,875 vehicles in the first quarter of this year, which was only a modest increase on the 405,278 delivered in Q4. Now, Elon Musk said at the start of this year, that while the aim for Tesla was to make 1.8 million vehicles this year, this fiscal year, a figure of 2 million was possible. Um, now, that would then mean that you've got to deliver around about 500,000 vehicles, deliver 500,000 vehicles per quarter. So at the moment, they're short of that on their first quarter. Um, Musk has gone to great lengths to assure investors that demand is strong. Orders are coming in at twice the rate of production since the recent price cuts were announced. And that's the rub, I think, when it comes to deliveries. Is Musk able to generate the number of deliveries without impacting margins and therefore profits and revenues? And I think that's the big unknown at the moment. On automotive gross margins, it's expected they should stay above 20%. Um, but this forecast does have a huge element of uncertainty around it. And only today um, that Tesla has announced price cuts in Germany. So in the face of increasing competition, in the face of rising costs of raw materials, will Tesla be able to deliver? And if it is able to deliver, will it be able to deliver the revenues and profits that investors hope that they will be able to do? So keep an eye on the 200 day moving average. Keep an eye on this support around about 165 because um, that should determine where we go to next. But it is struggling anywhere near those elevated levels there. We've also got Netflix is Q1 numbers. And you know, Netflix has, has actually been, been doing reasonably well. It does appear that its ad supported tier is performing fairly well. As indicated in the Q3 shareholder letter, Netflix is no longer offering guidance on its subscriber numbers and that it would be rolling out its paid sharing in the first quarter of this year, the numbers that we're currently, that we'll be currently looking at um, this week. It's looking to crack down on password sharing and a nod to having to cut costs. Netflix has announced, Netflix announced last month that it will be cutting its film output and streamlining its business model. And that does appear to suggest that rather than focusing on subscriber numbers, it's now starting to focus on revenues, margins, and cash flow. In the Q4 of last year, it was cash flow positive for the first time in that particular quarter. And it's now very much about um, being able to generate a return, gener push those returns into new content, and more important, more high quality content in an, in an environment where companies like Disney are now looking to cut costs, um, become Disney Plus become less of a loss leader, having to also compete with the likes of Amazon Prime as well and Paramount Plus. So there's an awful lot of fare out there and Netflix needs to make sure that it has a strong handle on costs as it as it looks to recover um, the losses that we saw from the peaks back in November 2021. We still remain some way short of that, half the levels that we were then. Those numbers are due out on the 18th of April. Tesla's are due out on the 20th of April. And last, but by no means least, going to be looking at EasyJet, um, because since they issued their first quarter update, um, three months ago at the start of the year, the share price has pretty much gone sideways. Um, they posted a first quarter loss of 
133 million pounds before tax. EasyJet Holidays is adding strength to the bottom line. It posted a 13 million profit during Q during the first quarter of this year. Guidance here was raised from 30% growth to circa 50% year on year for EasyJet Holidays with bookings for it and the airline delivering a record revenue days during January. For the first half, EasyJet says it still expects to book a loss, albeit it should be significantly lower than the same period a year ago. Well, you would think so, wouldn't you? Guidance was kept unchanged for the first half, um, with, the, uh, with the airline saying it expects to fly around 38 million seats in the first half of this year and 56 million seats in the second half of this year, a 9% increase. I think investors will be hoping that it's able to generate a profit. Thus far, it's been unable to do so, unlike its sector peer, Ryanair. Um, if you look at where the share price was back in May 2021, it's still got quite some way to go before it gets even close to those sorts of levels. So I think this week's second quarter numbers should be a key test of that aspiration. So that's it for this week. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you very much for listening. This is Michael Hewson talking to you from CMC Markets. Have a great weekend.